Okay, everyone. So um, as I told you, today uh, we are uh, talking about uh, some very, very famous mythological figures, Dionysus, of course, which uh, your friend, uh, Ms. Shada, talked about completely, very beautifully. And then we will also talk about Pan, we will talk about Echo, and we will talk about Narcissus. So as uh, Ms. Shada also talked about, Dionysus uh, fell in love with a girl named Ariadne. Now, if you like the uh, if you like the movie Inception, just as much as I do, you will know that the you know one of the characters in the movie of Inception by Christopher Nolan was was called Ariadne, and she was always wearing a red sweater. Now, before I talk about the marriage of Dionysus and Ariadne as as like an introduction or a prologue to our lecture about Dionysus, I just want to talk about the story of Ariadne a little and why the names the name was significant in the movie Inception. Now, we had uh, a queen on the island of Crete in Greek mythology called Pasiphae. Now, Pasiphae had a, a, a bull, a cow, which she loved. She actually loved the cow so much that she mated with the cow. And so Pastiphae was the queen. She mated with the uh, cow and now she had a baby. The name of that baby is Minotaur. So Minotaur was a, like a monster. Some parts of it were human and some parts of it were the bull. And so he was very, very dangerous. So Minotaur was the illegitimate son of Pasiphae and a cow. Now, Minotaur was a monster, and the island of Crete, the people were afraid of him and didn't know what to do with him. So Pasiphae, the queen, asked Daedalus, one of the most famous mortals in Greek mythology, to actually try to control Minotaur, who was very big, who was very dangerous, and so Daedalus created a maze, a labyrinth, Yek Hezar for Minotaur to stay in. And so Minotaur would spend all of his days stuck and locked up in the maze because Minotaur could not find his way out of the maze, out of the labyrinth. Now the story goes like this. Well, Ariadne was the sister of uh, Minotaur and she actually wanted to free Minotaur because Ariadne believed that well Minotaur is can respond to love if you show him love he will calm down and he will not destroy everything in his vicinity so one day Ariadne goes into the maze finds Minotaur in the middle of the maze and then leaves some red thread. That's what Ariadne does. So Ariadne becomes the guide for Minotaur to rescue him from this labyrinth. And again, if you have seen the movie Inception, Ariadne is a student of architecture and then he builds a maze for the main character of the film, the Cobb, the protagonist, and then also helps Cobb come out of his labyrinth. Because, again, if you have seen the movie, you know that Cobb, Cobb's wife uh, had committed suicide and Cobb was stuck in a kind of maze in his own mind. And it was Ariadne who actually helped him Come out of the maze, deal with his demons so that Cobb could come back to reality. So that's the story, that's what's significant about the story of Ariadne. Now obviously Ariadne fell in love with Dionysus and the two got married. So I would like to start our, uh, well if you haven't already seen Inception, I think, well, the spoilers are, 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 are <laughs> are not really important. You should have seen it sooner. 
uh, because it is a masterpiece. Anyway, so let's begin our lecture on Dionysus. I'm going to talk about him very quickly because your friend talked about him. So I would like to start the lecture by talking about actually uh, this excerpt from Xenophon's Symposium on the marriage between Dionysus and, of course, Ariadne. So when Dionysus cast his eyes upon her, he danced over to her, to her, and like a lover sat upon her lap. He took her in his arms and kissed her. Ariadne behaved modestly, but nevertheless she lovingly embraced him. When the party guests beheld this, they kept applauding and shouting for an encore. And when Dionysus got up and drew Ariadne up with him, then you could see a real performance as they proceeded to kiss and fondle one another. The audience saw a very good-looking Dionysus and a gorgeous Ariadne not playing a role, but actually truly kissing each other. And they all watched with great excitement. In the end, in the end of the, the dinner guests, uh, seeing the couple embracing and moving off to their marriage bed, the unmarried ones vowed to get married, and those who were already married got on their horses and rode off to visit their wives. This very short excerpt uh, from Symposium by Xenophon tells you that, well, not only was Dionysus the god of wine, ecstasy, fruitfulness, he was also in inspiring love in people. He was also inspiring and exciting passion, enticing passion in people. And that's, that's, that's what this story tells us, that he also made people passionate, made people love. And that's why the unmarried people, the bachelors of the party, vowed that they would get married as soon as possible. And those who were married and were, you know, alone watching the dance decided to get up, ride their horses back to their wives. So I just wanted to put this out there that Dionysus is also associated with love and passion, of course. Now, we have different stories about the birth of uh, Dionysus. Uh, the most famous one of them is, is the fact that, well, Zeus and Thymile had an affair and then Hera became jealous and so decided to kind of remove Thymile as a... Uh, as a kind of like opponent in love. Uh, however, when uh, Simile was destroyed, Zeus successfully, uh, successfully rescued the kid. Now, the story that Meshed also talked about was that Hera convinced Simile to ask her lover to show him, to show her who he really was. And and so Simile asked Zeus, please uh, promise me something. And then Zeus said, what? What, sh what should I promise you to do? And then she said, no, you have to promise first. And then I will ask you. And because Zeus loved her, uh, she said, okay, I promise to do whatever you ask me. And then Simile asked him, can you show me who you really are? And then because Zeus had promised her, um, Zeus showed himself who he really is with all of his glory, but then Simile was burnt because she couldn't handle the, the, uh, the magnitude of uh, Zeus and of course his splendor. However, as you can see here in this picture, uh, she was burning, but then Zeus rescued the sun and hid the, uh, hid the sun in his own thigh. And then when later on the time was right, Dionysus was born. And so throughout Greek mythology, Dionysus becomes a god of vegetation in general, in particular vineyards, the grape, and of course making and drinking of wine. But as Panmesheda beautifully mentioned, there is a second side and there is a dark side to Dionysus as well, because Yes, he was a god of passion and love, as I showed you a couple of minutes ago. But he was also an extremely cruel god, 
especially when people defied him, when people did not obey his orders, when people rejected him. So when people did reject him, he turned into, he used to turn into this very cruel and brutal force of the gods and he would punish them severely. And the best example for this, which you can find in Euripides' play called the Bacchae, is the story of Pentheus versus Dionysus, which Van Mesheda talked about. Pentheus was the king of Thebes. He rejected the worship of Dionysus and Dionysus said, okay, I'm going to punish you. And the punishment was this, that Pentheus's mother and his sisters were the followers of Dionysus and they can, and they suddenly uh, turned, became ecstatic and uh, could no longer recognize Pentheus and saw him as a lion. So they attacked him, they tore him to pieces and even Pentheus's mother moved back to Thebes with his own son's head, thinking that she had actually killed a lion. But then suddenly the ecstasy wore off and realized that she had killed her own son. And so, of course, the name Pentheus itself means a man of sorrows. And that kind of tells you the story of what happened between Pentheus and uh, Dionysus. But Dionysus had other opponents as well. So I have included two other opponents here. The daughters of King uh, Proteus uh, were actually among the opponents of Dionysus, people who rejected Dionysus. And so these daughters, the daughters of uh, the King Proteus, actually rejected Dionysus and, of course, uh, Dionysus punished them forcing them to leave their countryside, leaving their homes and killing their own children, of course. And so, of course, uh, when later on uh, they accepted their mistake, uh, their madness was cured. But when people did not accept their own mistakes, Dionysus wouldn't forgive them. And so in this story of uh, Botea, the daughters of uh, Minias refused to participate in the worship of Dionysus. And then Dionysus disguised himself in the, you know, in the form of a girl and then tried to tell them, come on, guys, don't oppose Dionysus. Dionysus in day is dangerous, but they didn't actually listen to him in the, you know, in this guise, even when she was disguised as a girl. And so, of course, uh, they were punished again and they were driven mad and they were not cured. Uh, but now let's talk about uh, a certain aspect of Dionysus, which I would like to tell you about. And that is Dionysus's rituals and, of course, his religion. What was his religion? What kind of rituals did he have in ancient Greece? The essential characteristics of any kind of uh, Dionysiac religion is, of course, uh, you know, ecstasy, especially through music and dance. So people become uh, ecstatic through listening to music and through dancing, and they are suddenly possessed by the god, and they go into a state of trance. Yeah, let the shift the eva shadei peydom konan ke digaz atrapeshun. They usually sacrificed animals and they started eating raw flesh. So these all, all of these were actually part of the ritual of uh, Dion Dionysian uh, ceremonies throughout Greece, uh, Greece. Now we also have some religious congregations. When people congregate, when people go to the same place to worship Dionysus, now, they were divided when people congregated, when people, you know, uh, gathered in a certain place to worship uh, Dionysus. They were divided into certain groups, and then each group had a male leader who played the role of God, and the people who were present started worshiping this leader as if he were Dionysus. And so, by extension, they were actually... Um, 
um, praising uh, Dionysus, the god of wine. Now, Dionysus had a lot of opponents, yeah, of course, but he also had a lot of followers. And now we are going to talk about his followers because we have two different names for the female followers of Dionysus and the male followers of Dionysus. And the reason why this is important for us is because the male followers have, you know, some interesting stories, including Pan, which we are going to talk about, whom we are going to talk about. So that's why I'm talking about this, because it will help us transition to my next stories about Pan, Echo, and Narcissus. Now, the Bacche, or the, as you can see here, the Menads, were actually the women, the female followers and devotees of Dionysus. And so, because although they were mortal, they followed Dionysus and because of that became nymphs or, you know, not, they were no longer mortals, okay? Just because they believed in Dionysus and followed him. And uh, these are, you know, uh, some of the dances and rituals in, uh, in for Dionysus. Now, the, the male followers of uh, Dionysus were called satyrs. So satyrs were the male followers of Dionysus. But they were not complete humans, which means that they were part human and part animal. Usually, usually the animal part was either a horse or a goat. So they had the lower body of the human beings and the upper body of a goat or vice versa. The lower body of a goat and the upper body of a human being. So uh, the male followers of Dionysus were called satyrs and satyrs loved dancing and singing and making music, making wine, and drinking it. And of course, one of their sports was also, you know, chasing those uh, female followers, the main ads. Uh, and, and so, you know, they were uh, playing all the time, they were following them, uh, etc. Uh, <clears throat> now, I will talk about one of the most the reason why, as I said, the reason why I am talking about satyrs is because we actually have a god in Greek mythology by the name of Pan, which looks like a satyr, which looks like a satyr. So he is half man and half goat. And that is the reason why I talked about uh, satyrs in this part of my lecture. But before that, I would like to talk about something that Panmesh Shade also mentioned but then talk about it a little more, uh, just a little more. You know, as Van Meshed also mentioned, Dionysus is usually considered to be a patron of theater, a supporter of theater. Why? Because, uh, you know, the essence of Greek drama, actually, it can be found in the Dionysian rituals, which happened every year in Greece. So, so that's what that's what happened and tragedy and comedy came into existence because of Dionysus. What happened? What happened was that every year we had some celebrations in Athens in ancient Greece to celebrate Dionysus and the god of, you know, harvest. This is when the uh, rituals happened. Every year the the Greeks wanted to thank the gods because of good harvest, especially when they had a good year, they had, you know, a lot of crops, they had a lot of, you know, uh, everything on their land, everything was growing. And because Dionysus was the god of vegetation, they wanted to thank Dionysus. And so Dionysiac rituals, Dionysian rituals were actually quite rampant, were actually happening a lot in Greece. Now, what was the custom? The custom was that there was a there was a group of singers which were called the chorus, which I just wrote for you in the chat section. The chorus was a group of like 50 people who started singing and dancing. And those songs 
were actually praising Dionysus and thanking him for that year's harvest, that year's vegetation. So I'm sure you're familiar with the word chorus because we also have chorus in Greek tragedy. Now, these 50 people were, you know, divided into different groups and they sang on a stage, on a platform in these rituals. In one of the years when this ritual was going on, there were three different people, three different people who wrote songs, who three famous writers who wrote songs for these rituals. And they are called, in uh, Greek history, they are called the Big Three. The Big Three included three of the most famous playwrights and dramatists of ancient Greece. So included in them was Euripides, was Aeschylus, and Sophocles. So let me just write them for you. Euripides... Aeschylus and Sophocles. These were the writers who were writing songs for the Dionysian rituals in ancient Greece. But in one of them, in one of these rituals, suddenly they thought, okay, what if, what if we separate one person from the chorus and give him a monologue? چی میشه اگه یکی از این پنج نفری که روی استیج دارن میرقصن و آواز میخونن برای ستایش داینایسیس رو من جدا کنم یه مونولوگ بهش بدم این مونولوگ رو بخونه در ستایش خدایان و به این صورت البته قبل از اینکه اینا خودشون این به ذهنشون برسه یه آقایی به اسم فسپس که براتون نوشتم و بهش میگن اولین بازیگر دنیا یا پدر بازیگری خودش یه جورایی از کورس جدا میشه میخواسته خودش رو نشون بده به خانمایی که اونجا بودن مثلا خودش رو جدا میکنه این جرقه تو ذهن این ستا روشن میشه که اوکی okay, what if I do this every year what if I separate a person from the group of chorus and give him a few lines so that he can tell me he can give a monologue to the audiences to the people who are present in these arenas and so Thespis actually becomes the first actor that we have. Then next year, one of these writers, like Sophocles, says, okay, what if I separate two people and give them dialogue and not monologue? So in the first year, Thespis comes forward and becomes a, a lonely, an, a person who's standing alone, separate from the chorus, and starts praising Dionysus. But then the next year, these playwrights say, okay, what if I separate two people from the chorus and give them dialogue? And step by step, drama is created. و از لابلای این ریشوال بوده که دراما به وجود اومده چون این نمایش نامی نویسه خلاق یوریپیدیز، اسکلیس و سافوکلیز این جرقه به ذهنشون میزنه که من چی میشه اگه من این کورس پنج و شست نفره رو که دارن آواز میکنن یکی دو نفرشون رو جدا کنم و دیالوگ بهشون بدم که بگن باز هم دیالوگ هایی در ستایش خدایان اما بعد از یه چند سال دیگه کم آزادتر میشن و به موضوعات دیگه یا میپردازن و دراما و تراجدی از اینجا به وجود میاد. So that is why Dionysus is actually associated with the genre of drama. So that's the story. Now let's talk about Pan. As I said, well this is what we are going to talk about until the end of the class. Now Pan was actually a, a god. Uh, in uh, Greek mythology, and he was the god of the wild, the wild animals, uh, the god of shepherds and flocks, of nature, of mountain, of rustic music and impromptus, and the companion of the nymphs. So as you can see here, he was a combination of man. He was a combination of man and goat, as you can see here. And that's why he looks like satyrs. 
he looks like those satyrs which were the followers of Dionysus and that is why we are talking about him. So uh, Pan has a, a lot in common with the satyrs. Uh, I don't know why you were reminded of Narnia. Anyway, so as we said, he's a man and he's a goat at the same time. He has some horns, he has some, you know, ears and legs of the goat. And then, of course, he was also joining that bucket ritual, which means he, he also loved joining the women followers of Dionysus to praise uh, Dionysus, of course. Uh, so, uh, the reason why I'm talking about Pan is because Pan is important for us, not only because he created the musical instrument, a Pan pipe. This is the Pan pipe in his hand. And we say that, well, he's also some patron of music. So, Pan created a musical instrument for himself called the Pan pipes, uh, which were, you know, a group of small pipes connected by a string. So he created Panpipe, of course, but the story of why he invented the Panpipe is really interesting for us. Uh, so another name for Panpipe in Greek is uh, Syrinx, okay? Now, let's see why he created this. Now, Syrinx was a lump, lovely nymph. She was a very gorgeous uh, nymph and Pan was actually in love with Syrinx. However, you know, uh, Syrinx was actually very devoted to Artemis, who was the virgin goddess. We talked about her. And so the Syrinx rejected all of the proposals of the satyrs. Now, one day, of course, Pan sees her. And of course, he falls in love with her. He pursues her. But then, because... Uh, Syrinx was a follower of Artemis and Artemis wanted all of her followers to be virgins. Um, she doesn't want to sleep with Pan and so she asks the goddess and of course she's turned into a marsh. And, the, and the, when the wind goes through this marsh, so she turns into a kind of, you know, a geographical feature, right? But when wind blows through that marsh, a beautiful sound is created. A beautiful sound which is very melodious. And actually, Pan falls in love with the sound. And because he was in love with Syrinx, but of course he could not be with her, okay? So, he... Uh, توی مناطق استوایی یه سری گیاهان هستن که ساقه های خیلی باریکی دارن مثل فلوت میمونه منظور اون از اینه یک زمین باطلاقی که همچین گیاهانی توش روش میکنه So when the wind was blowing uh, through these reeds which looked like the flute they created a beautiful melody and Pan was in love with that melody and because he was in love with syrinx he actually created a musical instrument in her honor, which created the same beautiful melodious sound. And that's why uh, uh, this beautiful story exists. And as I said, because he loved Syrinx, he created that uh, musical instrument. But Pan's love affair is also connected to another mythological figure whom we are going to discuss in today's class, and that is Echo. Now, Pan also loved another nymph called Echo. So he loved Syrinx, the nymph, but he couldn't be with her. So, you know, he created the Pan pipe in her honor. But he also had some passion for another nymph called Echo. But of course, this story also ended tragically. So once again, Echo did not want to be with uh, Pan because she was also a nymph. She was also a follower of Artemis. And so uh, Pan, of course, he was a god, right? And so Pan uh, 
sort of created a punishment for Echo. And the punishment of Echo was that he was torn, she was torn to pieces. And the only thing that remained of her was her voice. And that's why her name is significant. Her name was Echo. So Echo was a nymph, but didn't want to be with Pan. And so Pan punished her by destroying her. And the only thing that remained of her was her voice. You know, some badani, cheesy as a shnamun, but that's the the wood. But that's the Hitch, shekle fiziki, the echo, nadash. پس این هم از داستان اکو اما داستان اکو به اینجا ختم نمیشه و اکو وصل میشه به یکی دیگه از شخصیت های اساتیری به همین دلیل بود که من این چند تا رو کنار هم آورده بودم که صحبت میم راجع به داینایسس بعد یکی از فالوور های داینایسس چی بود؟ اون ساتیر ها بودن حالا یکی از خدایانی که شبیه این ساتیر ها بود پن بود پن عاشق یه نیمفی میشه به اسم اکو که چون بهش جواب منفی میده تنبیهش میکنه کل بدنش از بین میبره فقط صداش میمونه و حالا میخوایم ببینیم اکو خودش چه زندگی داشته و چطور با نارسسس دست و پنجه نرم کرده و همونطور که میدونین اگر با کلمه نارسیسیزم یا خودشیفتگی آشنا باشین کلمه نارسیسیزم که یک کلمه روانشناختی برای خودشیفتگی بیش از حد از این داستان اساتیری میاد ریشش هم برمیگرده به یه مقاله‌ای که آقای زیگمنت فروید روانکاو معروف می‌نویسه به اسم آن نارسیسیزم یه مقاله می‌نویسه یه مقاله‌ای در باب خودشیفتگی که داستانش رو بر اساس همین چی بیان می‌کنه همین داستان اساتیری همونطور که مثلا بحث عقده ادیپ ادیپس کامپلکس رو آقای فروید باز بر اساس داستان اساتیری ادیپس د کینگ یعنی کلی از ایده های روانکاوانه آقای فروید ریشه در داستان های اساتیری داشته که حالا اینا ایشالله اینا رو بعدا توی کلاسه نقد ادبیتون وقتی که نقد روانکاوانه رو میخونین خواهید خوند اما بریم داستان اکو و نارسیسیس رو بخونیم Well, we know that Echo rejected Pan and so Pan caused her to be torn to pieces so that only her voice remained But Echo's life also has another story. The story of her love. She fell in love with a person called Narcissus. And Ovid's version in Metamorphosis is a beautiful version. I have included all of the story in this uh, PowerPoint presentation for you. You can read it yourself, but I'm just going to tell you the summary of uh, the story, okay? So uh, let me just tell you the story and let's stay on this slide here. Now, Echo, well, of course, uh, first let's talk about the birth of uh, Narcissus. So Narcissus was a, an extremely handsome man and uh, well, He was really, really handsome. He was really beautiful. Everyone who saw Narcissus actually fell in love with him. But he didn't want to be with any girls. So when so many different nymphs approached him and told him, hey, we are in love with you, he ran away from them and he said that He didn't want to be with any girls, okay? So there are some like homosexual uh, meanings and tendencies in his story. Uh, we will talk about it later. So uh, Narcissus did not want to be with any girls. And, and so he rejected all of the proposals. I'm sorry. Well, this is the important phone call I told you about. Just give me a second. Sorry. Hey everyone, sorry about the uh, interruption. So let's continue. So as I was saying, Narcissus rejected the advances of all of the nymphs, all of them. But then Echo also saw the beautiful face of Narcissus and fell in love with uh, Narcissus. But of course, Echo had no body. 
there was only the voice. So uh, Echo followed Narcissus and kept telling him, Narcissus, I love you. But then Narcissus could not see her. So everywhere he looked, he was unable to find, uh, you know, uh, he was unable to find Echo. And he kept asking her, where are you? Who are you? I can't see you. And then, you know, Echo would tell her, would tell him that, hey, look, uh, I'm a beautiful nymph. Believe me, maybe if you love me back, I can ask one of the gods to actually solve my problem. But then when Narcissus realized that Echo was also a nymph, she said, okay, no, I don't want to be with you. I don't want to be with anyone. And, and therefore, Echo was really, really sad. And so uh, she prayed because she was sad that she was rejected by Narcissus. She prayed that so he may, so may he himself fall in love. So may he not be able to possess his beloved. So uh, kind of uh, Echo prayed to the gods and said that because he rejected me, I, I really hope that the gods punish him and make him fall in love with someone that he cannot be with. I really hope that he falls in love desperately, but I also really hope that he cannot be with his beloved. And that's actually what happened. That's what happened to Narcissus. So the next day, Narcissus goes to the river and wants to, you know, uh, drink some water. And he sees his own reflection in the river. And he instantly falls in love with his own reflection. And he believes that this is a sea creature. So he sees his own reflection. And he falls in love with himself. He doesn't know that this is a reflection. He believes that what he sees in the water is actually a, a water god or a water creature. Why? Why doesn't he recognize himself? The reason why he doesn't recognize himself is that when he was born, when he was born, the gods told his mother that the only way the only way that uh, Narcissus would continue to live a long life because his mother was worried. That, uh, please, God, tell me if my son is going to grow up and grow old and is not going to die soon. And Tiresias, Tiresias was a very wise man who could foresee the future. Tiresias and even the other gods told her that as long as your son doesn't know herself, he can continue to live. So وقتی که خودش رو نشناسته و خودش رو نبینه هیچ مشکلی نداره. این پیشگویی در ابتدا برای مادرش یه چیز بی‌معنی بود. این میگه یعنی چی خودش رو نبینه و خودش رو نشناسه. اما به هر صورت اونو از هر چه میدونم آینه و فلان و چیزی دور نگه داشته بود. هر چیزی که بتونه رفلکشن خودش رو توش ببینه. So this is when the story happens. He suddenly, Narcissus is alone. His mother is not around to prevent him from seeing his own reflection. He looks down into the river. He sees himself in the river and he instantly falls in love. And of course, he asks the reflection. He asks the reflection, please come out of the water. Please, whatever I do, you, you imitate and you repeat. I bring my lips close to the water. You come up to the surface and want to kiss me. I raise my hand and you raise your hand. Why don't you come out of the water so that we can be together? Because he believes that his reflection is a creature. And so he becomes so infatuated, so much in love with his own reflection that step by step he becomes crazy. He becomes passionate and then he finally dies out of sadness just because uh, he cannot be with his beloved the reflection in the water 
And so he feels that, okay, uh, he's not, he's never going to find a lover and he perishes, he dies. Of course, later on, to commemorate the memory, to cherish the memory of Narcissus, when people find out that uh, she has, uh, he has died, especially when Echo, when Echo, who was rejected by Narcissus, sees that he has also died, he asks the god to, to remember him. He asks the god to commemorate him. And his body and all of the fluids coming out of his body turn into flowers. So instead of a narcissus, a flower, a beautiful flower rises from the ground, which becomes uh, the symbol for uh, Dionysus, uh, for Narcissus. Gul Nargis, alam migan ke Gul Nargis ke madarim Narcissus. Dagigan as hamin umade, as hamin jo umade. Gul ye ke as ashka va alon mawadi ke as badan Narcissus daf shode ke var ruye zamin rikhte. Tamami onja Gul Nargis rosh kardan. Balon Gul Nargis namadi az in dostane asatiri. As I said, this story has created a psychological, this story of self-love and self-destruction was actually very, very uh, beautifully mentioned in Ovid's Metamorphosis. And of course, his affliction is very ironic because he fell in love with himself. And of course, his punishment was exactly what he did. His crime, the punishment fit the crime perfectly. His crime was that he broke the heart of a lot of nymphs and in return his own heart was broken اون قسمتی هم که باز یه آیرنی دیگه یک کنایه و تنه دیگه هم توی اثر هست اون هم اینه که ما تو کل اسطوره شناسی و اصلا کل فرهنگ غربی میگیم خودتو بشناس به خودشناسی برس اما این داستان به صورت کاملا آیرونیکی به این میپردازه که خودشناسی برای نارسیسیست وقتی که بیش از حد شد به خود شیفتگی تبدیل میشه و باعث مرگش میشه uh, and so we have the terms narcissism and narcissistic which of course was created by Zygmunt Freud when he published in the 20th century his article on narcissism and so we have this story of beautiful story which happens between echo and narcissism so, um, well, thank you very much for coming to class today. I, I really enjoyed listening to the lectures of your friends. They were perfect. And Khanna uh, Ibrahimi, Nagin, is going to talk about uh, Hades next week. Next week, we are going to talk about the afterlife. What happens after people die? What happens in the underworld, in the realm of Hades? We are going to dedicate all of the session to the story of the underworld and of course Hades, which is very, very beautiful. I'm really sure that you will enjoy this. So uh, again, once again, Khamer uh, Brahmi, uh, let me activate your microphone. Do you want to say something? So this is what we are going to do next week. Khamer uh, uh, Salam. 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 Salam.